Good morning. Uh, we're glad to be with you again today from Columbus, Emmanuel Baptist Church. And we've had, a, we've had a good week. We've had a chance to make some connections with our neighbors right around the church. I trust you're doing that as well at your home. We are the church. Be the church out there. We're at our neighborhoods. We're not able to meet together. But uh, hopefully that's changing. We are setting June the 7th as the Sunday that we're going to come back together and restart our morning services. We're not going to break into our groups afterwards, but uh, we're going to be communicating with you. We'll send uh, detailed information to you, and we'll discuss all the different facets of that day. We're going to strive to meet CDC guidelines and take uh, precautions that are necessary. We're looking forward to just, just come back together again. It's appropriate. It's time. So I'll be praying with us about that as we plan and uh, look forward to just inviting a friend and a neighbor. Come and let's reinitiate together as a body of Christ here together. So that's going to be June the 7th. We are in John chapter 15, verses 18 to the end of the chapter. And we're going to take a little section of chapter 16 this morning. What we're going to reveal, what we're going to talk about, what John shows us is just the battleground that's so real. It's all around us. Jesus is ministering to the disciples as he's about to go to the cross. He, in this final discourse, he's encouraging, teaching, instructing, ministering to, serving the disciples. He has just communicated with them how important it is uh, to love one another. You know, Christians are, are to be defined. We're to model the love of God in our life. He's reinforced that and continues to do that with the disciples. The dilemma is we live in a world that is uh, just filled with conflict because we face it in our own lives. We feel the conflict. We face conflict. Here it's specifically in this passage a conflict that is, that is driven towards those who are in Christ because of their identification with Christ. So we're going to see that this morning. We're going to see a reminder here of the love of God. Um, that's the kind of the context, pre, the, in the immediate context. And then just a reminder, Jesus says here in verse 18, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. And so he turns that coin over and he starts a discussion on um, how they're going to need to respond, how they're gonna need, what they're going to need to understand. Because there's days coming when they're going to step into ministry and Jesus isn't going to be there physically. He's going to be in heaven. So he's preparing them, and he's preparing us to engage a world where there is spiritual conflict. So this morning, we're looking at really some, some helpful information to us. How is it that we as Christians can respond to a world that hates us? How do we respond to, to hatred? Well, first thing that we have to do is simply look at the cause. What's the cause of this hate? Where does it come from? Well, we're in John 15, so let's begin to walk through this and just see what uh, John uh, communicates from the Lord's heart to us this morning. So John 15, beginning in verse 19, Jesus says, If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. There is a real disconnect in priorities. That's one of the reasons that the world hates us, uh, hates Christians, pushes back so strongly against Christ. We are not, we are not in this world. Uh, the scripture calls us aliens, sojourners. That means that, that ultimately in our walk in Christ, we don't live with goals that are the world's. We're not to identify with the pursuits that this world places in front of us as the priorities that need to be the priorities of our life. Um, we, we have a set of priorities and values, a worldview that is diametrically opposed to and different than the world's. And so it sets up a conflict immediately. We're told in 1 John we're not to love the world, we're not to love the things in the world. Now when he says we're not to love the world, he's not talking about people there. He says we're not to love the world system, uh, the way the world thinks, uh, the world, the world view. We're not to love uh, all the things that are in the world, uh, just the just the possessions and the materialism, the consumerism. Uh, it's it's a real struggle living in America for believers to rise above that temptation, that battle, to live for Christ first and not for things and not for position. 
And John reminds us here that the, that the world is, is going to pass away someday. And the things that we strive so much for, if they're simply going to be in the here and now, they're going to be gone one day. So Jesus is reminding us there's priorities that are eternal. That is lives. That is a testimony for Christ that are vastly more important. There's another reason if we come to verse 20 and 21. Jesus says, Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all of these things they will do to you on account of my name. The world hates Christianity and Christians because of our identification with Christ. Anywhere, it seems like in public dialogue today, in most cases, if the name of Christ is brought up, there is an immediate uh, pushback against the use of the name of Christ in the public arena. There are many who are working to eliminate the name of Christ from the public arena, whether it's online and, and media platforms, um, in, in various functions that are a part of the public and the military, whatever that might be. There, there is a pursuit by many to remove the name of Christ from conversation, from public conversation. The believer, because of our relationship with Jesus Christ, we're called to speak of Christ, to proclaim the truth of Jesus Christ, to stand for Christ, to present the gospel, which is simply good news, to share the good news of Christ to, to, uh, um, to humanity who is in great need and needs a Savior. And so we can never step back and deviate from, from that message that the Lord has given to us. That is our calling. That is the one thing that He has given to us to do is to live for Jesus Christ and to, and to proclaim His name to a world who needs a Savior. And so he says here in these verses that the world, the world is going to persecute us because and on account of Jesus Christ. Uh, we're not greater than our Master because they are doing this presently in this text to Christ and he will, go, he will go to the cross tomorrow on Friday. They're going to do the same thing to us. Because they hate Him, they hate His followers. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, there's going to be pushback against you in your life. Verse 21 continues that. Jesus says, why? Because they do not know Him who sent me. There is a lack of relationship with the Father. There's a lack of relationship with Christ. You know, the religion is, is uh, very established in this world. Uh, an attempt to have a relationship with God is very established in this world. I believe that humans were made to worship. We were created to worship. Every culture, every country worships something. Even if we don't worship, uh, as it were, a deity, in the end we elevate ourselves to the highest point of priority. We worship ourselves. We are our own maker. We are made to, to desire something, a cause, uh, uh, a deity, a, a purpose greater than ourselves. That's given from God. Ultimately that is given to drive us to the Lord. Jesus Christ is the one who, who meets our ultimate needs, who is the only Savior, who is the only way, the only truth, the only life in John 14, 6. And so we present Jesus Christ. Um, and there is a world who doesn't have that relationship with, with Jesus Christ. And so there is, there is a disconnect there. Uh, there are those who are, who are trying to do the right thing, but without a relationship with God, without a relationship with Christ, Spirituality is, is self-driven. A relationship with Christ is driven from, from the grace of God, the forgiveness of Christ into my life. It changes me. He changes me. Not my attempts at trying to, to, uh, to have a, a connection with, with someone or something bigger than myself. It is a relationship. And there is a lack of relationship here. Which, which so, so when, when I hear the message of Christ without that relationship... It, it brings a response from my heart. Verse 22 through 24, we see another reason why the world hates us so much. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my Father. Jesus has come. He has done, he has done a work, miracles, signs, spoken parables, 
done wonders. He has presented the ministry of the Father with power, with love, with grace. He has changed lives. He has, he has been the fulfillment of everything written in the Old Testament. And yet, and yet the Jews here find themselves at odds, at odds with God, at odds with God. Here we have a world that uh, Jesus comes to, and yet their response leaves them guilty. Now he says here, interestingly, he says, uh, "If I had not come, they would not have been guilty of sin." He's not teaching here that that they would have been sinless; they would have been without guilt. Romans 3.23 and other scriptures make it clear for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Even these here. What they are guilty of is the specific sin of, of rejecting the person of Jesus Christ in the flesh. They, are re, they have rejected the fulfillment of the Old Testament as personified in Jesus Christ himself. God has come in the flesh to them as a nation. In fact, John begins that way in, in chapter 1. He says, I came to the world and the world didn't know me didn't have a relationship, didn't understand, and, the, and my people, my own people, rejected me. They didn't receive me. So he's, he reminds the Jewish leaders and nation, you have rejected me. There's an accountability now to your soul. You are guilty because you have rejected the work of God in the flesh. Verse 25, he continues. He says, but the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without cause. The prophecy, they hated me without cause. It comes from, from their law, the Old Testament. The Old Testament is considered the law of God. The Jews have the law of God that's been given to them by God. And now they are held accountable. He calls it their law. By using the pronoun there, he is, he is attributing their accountability to the law of God and saying, God gave you something special. In your law, you have rejected uh, the prophecy. You have rejected the fulfillment of what, of what you have hoped for. Through the ages, the Messiah has come, a Savior has come, and you have rejected Him. It has been laid out in Scripture. You know, our, our ministry as believers comes from the Word of God, the power of the Word of God, the authority of the Word of God, and yet the world hates us. Uh, this this uh, verse 25, they hated me without cause, it comes from two areas in the Old Testament. I'll just use one. Psalm 69, David writes, More in, in number then the hairs of my head are those who hate me without cause. He says, my enemies are many. And so what Jesus is showing is the fulfillment of that prophecy, that reality in him as he's here. The scriptures foretell the separation that will occur when he created Adam and Eve. He put Adam and Eve in the garden. He says, you could eat of anything in the garden, but not the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He says, the day you do that, you're going to die. If you do that, there's going to be separation between you and me. The minute, that, the minute that they ate of that fruit, there was separation in their hearts. They died spiritually. They, sin came between them and God, and sin has stood between man and God ever since then. And they ran and they hid from God. They were afraid. They saw they were naked for the first time. They had been, but they didn't. They, it meant nothing. It was pure and clean and wholesome. And now, and now all these things had changed because of sin. John 3.20 just reminds us that we, we don't like to be exposed to the light of the holiness of God, to the good news of the gospel. Our, our flesh our flesh and our nature, it, it resists and it pushes back against the revealing work of grace that we are sinners and that we need a Savior. And so the world hates Christ because that message is going forth. Even the Gentiles, who the law was given to the Jews specifically, but it is also applicable to us, the Gentiles here, Paul says, they have a law. By nature, they do what the law requires. They are law to themselves. You know, we make rules. Every culture has its own rules. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness. God, God has put into, into the DNA of every, every human being um, the, the message from God the awareness of right from wrong, good and evil. We are born with the ability to understand that, that there, is, there is that which is wrong and there is that which is good. And then God uses that to draw us to Him. The Spirit of God uses those promptings when He touches our heart to draw us specifically to the Savior from as proclaimed in the Word of God. This isn't, speaking that all of us, this isn't saying that all of us have a spark of goodness. 
for all of us have sinned, but we have in our DNA an awareness. We can sear that conscience. We can, we can put it down so much that it no longer touches our heart, but it is there. Ultimately, man is without, is without um, we're guilty before God. We're without excuse. But you know what God says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's grace. That's the beauty of living in a world of hate. This is the good news. It changes us. Revelation ends the word of God. And Jesus says one more time, those who are thirsty spiritually, emotionally, in their heart, devoid of a relationship with God, bankrupt, can find, can find a relationship and a wholeness in Jesus Christ. Verse 26 and 27. Jesus says, When the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. The world hates us because Christ is being proclaimed, because we're speaking uh, the name of Christ. We've talked about that. We've shown that. He's to be the centerpiece of our life. We're to live for Jesus Christ. Our values are to reflect Jesus Christ, period. Our communication is to reflect our adherence to the Word of God. We are to speak the truth of the Word of God. We're to share the gospel message with people who need the Lord. And there was a pushback from the world because, because that is the message from a genuine believer. Jesus says, as he prays in the next chapter, we're going to enter. He says, Father, you sent me into the world, and I am sending every believer into the world as well. In fact, Paul says we are called to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ. We're to be a mouthpiece for Christ. And then we come to chapter 16, verses 1 through 4. Jesus says, I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. But they will do these things because they have not known the Father, nor me. And I have said these things to you that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. Christians are perceived as a danger, as a threat. The disciples were perceived as a threat. Jesus, of course, was. He was enemy number one. He was a wanted man. His posters were all over, as it were, and uh, they would, they would uh, execute him. The, the disciples would then become marked men as well, and anyone who identified with Christ. You know, the things written here in these verses are, are already beginning to happen in the Gospels. Believers are being excommunicated from the synagogue, maybe even for life because of their association with Christ. Um, Saul, who would become Paul, is going to pursue the church in Acts. He's going to go after it with a vengeance, and, and he's going to be behind murderers and believers going to jail. The world here in the time of the Jews is going to seek to eradicate Christianity. The world today is trying to do the same thing. It's to eradicate the influence of Christ and Christianity around us. We are perceived in our culture as a, as a real danger to, to, to some. And they are, ra they are acting out against that threat. And when they look at Christians, they don't see something good. They see something very threatening to their livelihood and to them and to the world. And so we are given all kind of descriptions and all kind of names, uh, but it's not a good thing. What we communicate is considered uh, hate speech. We are considered intolerant. We are considered judgmental and bigoted. The world hates us. So how are we to respond to this? What are we going to do? Well, the first thing that we can do is simply this. Keep, keep this at the forefront. We're to honor God with all of our heart. Uh, whatever we do, we're to honor God. Whether we eat or drink, whatever we do, we're to do it for the glory of God. We're to respond in such a way that God is going to be honored in how we respond. So let's, let's look at that. Number one, another way that we do that is simply this. Not to be surprised. We can't be surprised when it happens. When we, when, we are, when we are pushed back against because of our faith in Christ, when things happen to us and people un, uh, undermine us because of that, we can never forget that uh, the Lord has told us this is going to happen. First John 3, don't be surprised when the world hates you. Don't be surprised. I still, I still am amazed that Christians are surprised when, when terrible, horrible, awful things happen to them, when the world reacts to them. Folks, we should never be surprised. It's going to happen. Peter says we're going to be tested. In fact, Jesus says he's writing to who? To us. And he says, I love you. He says, Beloved. Don't be surprised at these trials, at these fiery trials. Don't be surprised. They're a part of my plan. They're a part of my grace into your life. They're a part of my ministry for you. 
And I love you as I give you these opportunities. I'm using them in your life. I'm using them for the glory of God. You are greatly loved as you walk through these. Never forget that. But in His love, God is going to allow us to experience the suffering that He suffered. In fact, He says this. Take note of this. 2 Timothy 3.12 If it's your desire to live a godly life, you will be persecuted. If you're sitting there this morning and uh, you affirm in your own heart, I want to be pleasing to the Lord. I want to honor the Lord. I want to do the right thing. Then you can be you can be sure that because that's your commitment, you are gonna you are gonna be hated because of that. There's gonna be pushback against you. There's gonna be loss in your life because of that. Your gain in Christ will be far greater, but there will be a loss in this world because of your commitment to Christ. We must be ready to accept that, to embrace that, to say, Lord, I'm yours, and I will serve you no matter the cost. Second, First Peter 2, suffering. We've been called to suffer. Christ suffered. He suffered for us. We are called to model that in our life, to embrace suffering, to serve others, to use suffering as a means, as a testimony for Christ. 1 Peter 5, 9 reminds us that the believers all around the world and every generation are fading, facing great persecution. Uh, even death, loss of homes, loss of jobs, loss of employment. There is more pushback in America than there ever has been. Christians are facing, taking more heat for being a Christian than ever before in this country. It is coming. It's going to get more difficult. It's going to happen. Are you ready? With, your, with a mind that is in Christ, are you ready to embrace and to, and to respond in a way that's going to please your Lord, your Savior? That's what being, we're being called to do that here in this verse, in these texts. We're to see suffering as a blessing in our life. I know that's so hard. It's really tough to get to that point. But by the Spirit of God, by the grace of God, embracing the love of God, we, we find ourselves here in this understanding. Luke tells us, blessed are you when people hate you. And when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name because of me, it is so hard to be excluded, to, to have loss that is personal, to lose things that, that mean very much to me, to lose things that are costly, maybe financially or emotionally or relationally. It's so hard to be at that place. He didn't say it would be easy. He never promised it would be easy, but he promised he'd be with us. He promised He would walk with us. He would give us the grace and the strength necessary. You can count on that. Matthew 5, Blessed are those who are persecuted for doing the right thing for righteousness' sake. It is an affirmation that, that the kingdom of heaven, your relationship with Christ is sure. Blessed are those when others revile you, persecute you, utter all kind of evil things against you, and falsely, boy, that's tough, when you're accused falsely. How do you respond to that? He says we're to rejoice, we're to be glad, we're to understand that we have a reward in heaven that will be ours when we walk through those moments of great difficulty in a way that honors Christ. You and I need to keep our eyes on the reward that we have in Christ. We need to keep our eyes on the glory of God. We need to keep our eyes on what God has promised us. The riches in Christ that will one day be ours are far more valuable than anything we could keep to ourselves and refuse to walk in Christ. Let's walk in Christ together. It is not a blessing, however, when, when, I am, when I am just pushed back against and people hate me because it's my fault, because of my sin, because I'm doing the wrong thing. What credit is it when you sin and when, when you're beaten because you've sinned? What credit is it when you've suffered because you've done evil? 1 Peter 4.3, but we're to rejoice as we share the sufferings of Jesus Christ. Rejoice and be glad. What's another response we're to have? Well, we're not to fight back. Again, this, this is a, these are all spirit-empowered. None of these can we do on our own. We simply can't do it. We're not to repay evil for evil, 1 Peter 3.9. On the contrary, we're to bless. Um, we're to seek to somehow bestow favor to the ones who hate us. We're to try to bring the love and grace of God into into our response towards others who would hate us so much. We're not to repay them. We're not to make it personal. You know, it's so easy to make, uh, to make uh, issues personal. When people hate us, we make it personal, and, and we hate back, and we respond in kind, and we push back, and 
And that is not at all the response that Christ would have us to have. In fact, it's entirely opposite. We are to reach out and, and have an entirely different response to them. We're not to fight people. Paul reminds us in Ephesians 6.12 that, that the fight that we fight is a spiritual battle. We're fighting the forces behind, behind the responses that people have towards us. If we see a particularly evil or wicked response toward us, we still must remember that the response is because of the force of evil in that person's heart. It is not with that person that we fight. It is with, it is with Satan and his forces that we are fighting. We are engaged in spiritual warfare. And that helps me. And it helps us to understand how it is we can engage others in the battle. In fact, instead, we're to fight the fight of faith. Paul says, I have fought the fight of faith, the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. He says, the focus is on, on proclaiming the faith, standing in faith, being a messenger of Christ. Matthew 10, 6, he says, We are sheep in the midst of wolves. Boy, what a description that is. How true that is. We're to be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Be wise as serpents. We usually think of serpents as bad and evil. and Serpents are, are cunning. They're shrewd. We're to, we're to avoid danger. Uh, we're to avoid conflict when possible. We're not to run into the run into the battle and look for conflict and look for danger. We're not to go looking for trouble. We're not to go looking for arguments, go looking for a fight. Um, that's not what we're to do. We're to, be, we're to be wise. When we do engage them, then we're to be ready to give an answer. We're to be ready to engage with grace and love. We're to be ready to stand on the truth of God's word, and we're to be innocent. Our, our demeanor, our character is to be an affirmation of Christ in us. We're, it is to stand strong with the words that are coming out of our mouth. Our character is to stand with our proclamation. We are to show Christ in that. We're to be like Christ. Matthew 5, 44, Jesus says, Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. And Luke, he says, Love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. Uh, we're to love our enemies. And Christ is the only... The only power and enablement to do that. We're to love them. We're to love them and pray for them. We're to do good to them. Luke 6 speaks here in this chapter of, you know what? It is, it is natural for us to love people who love us. It is natural for us to do good to those who do good to us. It is natural to extend to others something good that will give back to us, that'll, that'll, that'll love us the same way, it'll pat our back, that will affirm us he says, you know what, the love of Christ is vastly different than that. We're to love our enemies because there is a reward from heaven, from the relationship we have in Christ that is far greater than, than the loss of anything here. We are sons of the Most High God. We're to love our enemies. Suffering is a part of knowing Christ. Paul says, I want to know Christ and I want to know, I want to know Him in His suffering. I want to know that power. I want to become like Him. I want to walk as He did. I want, to, I want to pay the cost and embrace the cost of standing for the Lord. Another response that we're to have is simply to persevere. Matthew 10, 22. You will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. You know what? Every day, it is, it is a battle. It is a commitment to endure. Stay faithful. God is calling you to stay faithful. You're going you're gonna to face relational challenges your whole life. Because what we're talking about here is relationships. We're talking about people who simply don't like you, who don't want to be around you, who don't value you, who will seek to undercut and even hurt you because you've done the right thing. Because you stand in Christ. Because you're speaking the truth of the gospel. Because you affirm the priority of Jesus Christ. He is the only way, the only truth, the only life. They hate you simply because of that. And we are called to endure. We endure in the strength of the Lord. We endure by keeping our eyes on Christ. And again, just a reminder of how difficult this is. We're called to take a step that, that without the Spirit of God, without the work of Christ in our life is impossible. We're called to forgive. Paul says we're to be kind to one another, tenderhearted, but we're to forgive one another as Christ, as God in Jesus Christ has forgiven us. We are called to be forgiving to others. And uh, that is significant. Jesus Christ, He has forgiven you. If you're a child of God, it is because He forgave you. Because He forgave you, because He forgave me, we 
who are children of God, we must then we must then model what it means to be like Christ and forgive others who don't deserve it, just like we did not deserve it. We're not to repay people. But on the contrary, we're to bless them. We saw that. Paul tells us we're to meet, we're to, we're even to, we're even to meet their needs. If your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to, dr to drink. You know, people just have needs. The people who hate you the most, they still have life needs that are very deep, very significant. They, they are walking through life with a barrier between them and God. That puts, that puts every unbeliever in a place of great need. I'm a child of God. He's my Savior. And I have needs every day. I can't make it through a day without the Lord's help. Can you imagine walking through this life without the help, enablement, the power, the hope that we have in Christ? Everyone who opposes you that's an unbeliever is facing everything that they do in life without Jesus Christ. There's a need in their heart. We must never forget that. We must strive to meet even the physical, the emotional, the real needs that they have. Some of those who lash out though the hardest are hurting the most. We can never forget that. We're not to rejoice when an enemy falls. I'm, in fact, I'm going to go back here just a second. By doing so, we heap burning coals on their head. What does that mean? Well, that's one of two things here. One is this, is that, is that as, we, as we give this kind of love, God's going to bring a, a, a broken heart and, and repentance. And they're going to they're respond with faith in Christ. The other is this. They're going to continue. The other option is this. They continue to respond in opposition to you, and, and, but yet they stand now accountable to God in a new way because you, as you and I in Christ, in a way that honors Christ, have been a model and a testimony to them and have served them. We, they are now accountable to God for that moment of grace that we have extended, and they will answer for that. And it is, it is heaping the coals of judgment upon them. So there are two possible options, and there's not a clarity as to what it might be. It might be one or both. It just depends on, maybe on the situation and on the person, and of course what God's doing. We're not, we're not to rejoice when the enemy falls. We're not to be glad when he stumbles. You know, we fight, we fight spiritual battles. But at the same time, we are engaging real people. When God brings a victory over the enemy, when He brings a victory uh, over evil and over wickedness, we can rejoice in that. But remember that we are to love the enemy in that and still strive to be agents of grace. We are to, we are to strive to be faithful to do the right thing. Let those who suffer according to God's will entrust and commit their souls to their Creator, to our faithful Creator, while doing good. We are committed to Him. That is our strength. That is how we endure. We are faithful to Him because He is faithful to us. Be faithful to Him. Be faithful to Him. Be in the Word. Let Him feed your soul. And out of that, you will be able to do what is right and what is good when it comes to these, to dis, simply to difficult people. Luke 6, 27, I say to you, love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. That's just a reminder to us. One of, the, one of the most powerful ways we can engage our enemy is with the truth of God's Word, staying, standing strong on God's Word, but also while we are doing that, extending with great clarity the love of Jesus Christ to our enemy and being willing to... to to do, to bring good, to act on their behalf. Uh, how difficult that is. And we're to pray for them. Matthew 5, as we love them, we pray for them. These are, these are difficult things. In the Spirit of God, they're impossible. In the Spirit of God and the power of His Word, in yielding to Christ, to our Heavenly Father, we find the power and the enablement. We find the love that He's poured into our life we are able to give that love because He's poured it into us. You know what? When you spend time with God, He is filling your He is filling your soul with the fruit of the Spirit. He is filling you up with the character of Christ. And then, and only then, do you have something to give to others. Only then do you have something that will come out that will that will be a praise to Jesus Christ. So we are squeezed and pressured. What's going to come out of your life? If the grace and love of Christ comes out of my life, it shows what I am filled with. It shows the strength of my life. May the Spirit of God bring that to the reality of my soul. Finally, this. Uh, God's love is greater than our hate. 
If you don't know Jesus Christ this morning, the battle continues until you understand how much He loves you. I pray that you would respond to the reality that He loves you so much and He died for you and He took your place on the cross. We're reminded in Romans 5, when we were weak, that means helpless. When we were sinners and when we were enemies of God, He still loved us. In fact, He went to the cross. He died in our place. Uh, he showed His love for us. Uh, he declared us then when we received Jesus Christ as Savior. In that moment, He declared us to be right with God. For the very first time, that barrier between me and God was broken down when I received Him as Savior, when I confessed my sins. I was in that moment saved from the wrath of God. I was restored to God and I was saved by His very life. I tell you what, that is God overcoming hate. Uh, our message is one of grace and love. Folks, be committed to that. Love your enemy. Pray for them. Minister to them. Forgive them. Show them the power the strength of Jesus Christ. Show them the reality of the hope that lies in you. Lord, we pray that you would just minister to our hearts, loving our enemy, loving those who hate us, functioning in a world that increasingly is more antagonistic to Christians is not easy. You didn't promise it would be easy, but you promised you would give us all enablement, all capability, all power to do the right thing, to love as you would have us to love, to show grace as you would have us to show. May the result of that be changed lives, people being saved, and God being given the glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.